All right, so today we're going to review pretty much all of the concepts that we've learned in the chemistry unit of Science 9. This is, of course, in preparation for our unit exam that we have coming up around the corner. Uh, it's been a while since we've talked about a lot of these concepts, so I think it's really important that we sit down and really go through each and every single one. But the good news is I think, uh, I think it'll go quicker than, uh, than you might be thinking. But anyway, let's get going. So, like I just said, we're going to have a crash course of nearly everything we've learned in the matter and chemical change unit. I just call it chemistry for short, of course. Uh, basically, I just want to remind you of the concepts we've covered. I'll get you to go into deeper review afterwards. So this is just going to be a surface level review today. Uh, you'll, of course, need to go into much deeper review on your own uh, after this. Uh, just a bit of a heads up. You might even want to pause the video here and go get one or at least load it up on your computer or whatever if you have one. Um, but you'll want to have a periodic table handy today. There's going to be a few things we do, especially obviously with ionic and molecular compounds, that having a periodic table in front of you would really help. And remember, I do have uh, the periodic table, at least a digital copy of one, uh, posted on our Google Classroom page. So, of course, that would be a good place to go. Anyway, I'll stop rambling. Let's get going. So, first thing I want to go over in this matter and chemical change unit was the concept of a physical versus a chemical property. So when we talk about properties, we just talk about what we can uh, say to describe some kind of object, right? Now, physical object or physical properties, uh, those are just the ones that you would use your five senses to detect, right? Uh, so it'd be what you see, uh, what you hear, like if you drop something, it might make a different sound than if you drop something else, uh, what you smell, what you feel, what you taste, those are all physical properties of matter. Now, there's other things that uh, count as physical properties as well that aren't quite as obvious. Things like density, so how dense something is. You can often test that by seeing if it floats in water, for instance. Uh, melting point, boiling point, those kind of things that are numerical descriptions, those are physical properties as well. Uh, chemical properties, on the other hand, these are how matter interacts with other matter. So in other words, if you mixed this piece of matter with something else, what's going to happen? So some examples would be, uh, do they react with acids? If you mix... Uh, this with an acid, is it, gonna, is it going to dissolve in it? What's going to happen, right? Uh, does it burn, right? That's a chemical property. If you ever wondered why some things, when you heat them up, they cook or they melt, um, but then other things just straight up burn. Why is that? Those are chemical properties, right? Uh, reacts with water. There's some things, I remember we looked at it in, the, in class, of course, um, that if you mix them with water, there's quite an explosive reaction. Those are the things that are on the far left side of your periodic table. We can talk about that in a bit here, too. Uh, and then does it rust or tarnish, right? So things like silver, like in that picture, a silver spoon. If silver just sits in air long enough, it tarnishes. And that's a chemical reaction that's happening with the air. Anyway, moving on. Uh, some other things we can look at, some physical properties of metals versus nonmetals. Remember on your periodic table, metals are the ones that have a green background and the nonmetals are the ones that have that kind of orange peach kind of color uh, as a background. Uh, of course, in the real world though, away from your periodic table, Metals, of course, they all share similar physical properties. And some of these are pretty obvious. You know, you can probably tell by looking at something whether or not it's a metal. But uh, just to get it, uh, you know, to be explicit here, metals are shiny. At least you can polish them and make them shiny. Uh, they're malleable, which means they can be rolled into sheets. They can be flattened out. Malleable, I think, comes from the word mallet, which is like an, another way of saying a hammer. Uh, they're ductile. Uh, that just means they can be stretched into a long wire. Any kind of metal can do these kind of things. It's not just like things like copper. Any metal will be stretched into a wire. Some just stretch better than others, that's all. Uh, and then the last one conducts electricity. Also, some conduct electricity better than others, but all metals, to some extent, will conduct electricity. Nonmetals, of course, they're just the opposite of this. They're not shiny, they're not malleable, they're not ductile, and they don't conduct electricity. Uh, now we also have to talk about physical and chemical changes. This is not to be confused with physical and chemical properties. Uh, when we talk about a physical change, we're talking about the material changing from one state to another. So in other words, it goes from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas or whatever, right? That's a physical change. Physical changes are pretty easy to identify because that's pretty much the only, uh, the only kind of thing that would count as a physical change, right? It's also uh, important to realize that physical changes are pretty easily reversible. Usually just to change it back, you just either heat it up or cool it down. That's about it, right? Uh, chemical changes, on the other hand, these are a little more interesting. A chemical change of matter occurs when two or more materials react and create new materials. This isn't always reversible, or at least not easily. Uh, sometimes it's arguably not reversible at all. For instance, you can't uncook something. You know, it'd be kind of cool if you like could cook some food and then uncook it so you could put it away raw again. 
That's not how the world works though, right? Chemical changes, of course, cause one chemical to change to another thing. And oftentimes it is permanent. Not always, but oftentimes it is. Now, another important thing with chemical changes, chemical changes create new materials that often have different properties than the original materials. When two things mix together uh, and chemically react, something new with new properties will form. It won't look or act the same way as the things that made it, or at least not necessarily. Uh, other things we have to talk about in this course, of course, we talked about the changing models of the atom. Um, this one is just one you have to sit down and review. Basically, you have to understand that there was four that we were interested in. There's the Dalton model, which we called the billiard ball model. That's where Dalton just thought uh, all the atoms on the periodic table or all the atoms in the universe were just their own individual ball. So there was like a ball that would represent something like hydrogen. And then there's another ball that would represent something like iron. Um, all of these elements just had their own unique ball to them. So we called it the billiard ball model. Uh, the second person to come around is a guy named Thompson. He came up with a plum pudding model. I usually called it like the raisin bun model. You can also call it like the chocolate chip cookie model. Basically, what you have to understand about Thompson is he believed most of an atom was positively charged, but that there must be these little negatively charged pieces inside of it. Uh, and of course, those would be called electrons. So he realized that there was a positive and a negative piece electrically uh, to all atoms. Then comes Rutherford. This one is uh, one of the more interesting ones. Some, some people usually de uh, depict an atom as looking like this today, even though we know it's a little more organized than this. Rutherford was the one who realized that the uh, protons, so the positive pieces, and the neutrons, which are neutral, they're in the center of the atom uh, that we call the nucleus. Now, most of an atom is actually empty space, according to Rutherford, where all of this empty space is encompassed by these uh, electrons that are buzzing around that nucleus at, at really high speeds. Uh, so basically, Rutherford, he was the one who figured out that an atom is mostly empty space, which is true. Uh, he found that out, of, of course, by shooting particles at gold foil, and he found that while some of them bounce back, some of them literally just pass right through the gold foil, and they weren't deflected at all. Uh, the last one, this one's a little more true to what we believe today, uh, the Bohr model. It's kind of the same as uh, the Rutherford model. It's just Bohr realized that these electrons orbit in uh, energy levels. So in other words, they actually orbit kind of like planets orbit around the sun, they have specific rings that they sit in. Uh, they don't just completely buzz around randomly. There is a little bit of order to them. Now, this, this picture, of course, is a big simplification of it, but you know the idea still stands. Uh, Bohr figured out that the electrons have levels that they sit in. Anyway, that's, that's about all I got to say about those ones. All right, so uh, the periodic table, there's like a million things we could talk about with the periodic table. We'll get into some of like the details regarding individual elements in a bit. Uh, but basically what you need to understand about the periodic table are there are periods, periods go this way, they're horizontal, uh, and then there are groups, which are also sometimes called families. Groups are the ones that go uh, vertically. Uh, now the significance behind groups are things that are in the same group will have similar chemical properties. For instance, one of the more interesting groups is this group number one. Everything in this first group right here, this first column on the far left, they react really strongly with water. If you were to put any of those in water, they'd like they'd blow up, right? We had that video we watched where they put, uh, I think it was cesium, this one down here, they put cesium in a bathtub and it blew up the whole bathtub as if there was a grenade in there. These are pretty interesting. They will react strongly with water. Uh, these actually had a name, they're called the alkali metals. Uh, I don't know if you'll need to know that so much, but it is still useful to know. Uh, another interesting group is group 18. Group 18 are called the noble gases. They're called noble because they kind of think that they're already better than everything else. In other words, they don't react with anything. Helium, neon, argon, et cetera, they don't react with anything. They just kind of do their own thing. They think they're already perfect the way they are. So it is what it is. Uh, periods, on the other hand, where the periodic table get its name from, uh, periods will actually tell you how many energy levels there are around an atom. So think of Bohr's model. Um, if we looked at period four, that has like potassium and calcium and stuff in it, uh, if you were to draw a model of the atom for potassium, you'd have your nucleus, but then you would have four rings going around it. That was a pretty miserable drawing I just did there, but you get the idea, right? So periods just tell you how many rings around an atom there are. So how many energy levels for the electrons that there are. Uh, I guess some other things we can talk about periodic tables uh, include the fact that this is organized by metals versus non-metals. So the metals are the ones that occupy pretty much the first, like the left two thirds of the periodic table. They're all the ones with a green background. Non-metals are pretty much relegated to the far right over here, although hydrogen is 
technically a non-metal as well, and it's way over here. Um, there's metalloids that form this little staircase over here. We don't really worry about those too much in Science 9. They're kind of the kind of a bit of a wild card in a way, but you know we won't worry about those for now. Uh, I guess other things you could say about this is notice that uh, any of the ones that have black text, uh, which is the vast majority of them, uh, those are solids at room temperature, as you can see right here. Uh, any of the ones that are blue, those are liquids at room temperature. Those are pretty rare. There's only mercury and bromine. Uh, and then the ones that are red are gases at room temperature. So kind of neat. Now, this thing up here that tells you like for each and every single atom or element, I should say, on the periodic table, all of its information, we're going to get into that in about one second here. Um, but there's a lot you can really uh, unpack on the periodic table. All right. Oh, there we are. Speaking of uh, individual elements here. Uh, when you look at an individual element on a periodic table, there's a lot of information that it gives you, a bunch of different numbers. And these numbers are actually really useful for determining your protons, electrons, and neutrons. Remember, protons and neutrons, according to Bohr's model, the one we are using today, uh, protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, or in other words, the center of the atom. Electrons, on the other hand, are the ones that are sitting in those rings all the way around. Now, to determine how many protons, electrons, and neutrons you have, you just have to look at a couple of the numbers that are on uh, your element on the periodic table. So if we're looking at zirconium, which is uh, element number 40, uh, we can actually find the protons. I'll just say pro. Uh, we can find the protons just by looking at that element number. So the atomic number up in the top left-hand corner tells you how many protons there are in that atom. So we know there are 40 protons in zirconium. Protons are kind of interesting because protons actually tell you what atom you have. Uh, if it has 40 protons, it has to be zirconium. Electrons and neutrons, those can be a little, you know, they can change a little bit. They, they, they change depending even on what, uh, what charge you have, for instance. But one thing that does stay constant is protons. If you have 40 protons, you must be a zirconium atom. That's just what it is. Now, Electrons, at least in this course, electrons uh, are going to be kind of boring. Uh, electrons are going to always match the same number of protons. So we're going to say electrons here are 40. Now, the reason for this is we assume that atoms of zirconium are electrically neutral. Remember, protons have a positive charge and electrons have a negative charge. We want to assume that our, uh, our atom is going to be neutral. If we don't have a neutral atom, it's called an ion. And that's where this ion charge comes in. But we don't really break it down too much in this course in terms of saying, oh, what's, what's the protons, electrons, and new, neutrons of an ion of zirconium? I'm sure you could probably figure it out, but we're not going to worry about that, not in this course. Uh, anyway, last one, neutrons. This is the most interesting one to calculate because uh, it's not as crystal clear. Uh, neutrons is where you have to take the atomic mass. That's this number on the bottom, usually has a decimal to it. Uh, and you have to subtract your number of protons. So for our neutrons, we're going to have to go 91.2 minus 40. Sometimes it's a good idea to have a calculator around just to help you with this. This one, I don't think is a too, like that's not too tough of a calculation to do. 91.2 minus 40, that's 51.2. But we always just round to the nearest whole number. So I'm just going to say straight up 51. So there'd be 51 neutrons in zirconium here. Now, last part of the question here, how many electron shells, in other words, how many rings does zirconium have? Now, just looking at this one little box that I put on here, you wouldn't be able to figure it out. But if you look at your whole periodic table, I'll even just swing back for one second here. If you look at your whole periodic table, you can actually see that zirconium right here is in period number five. The period number is what tells you how many rings uh, an atom has. So we can say just by the location of zirconium that this has five electron shells. In other words, five rings. Hopefully that makes some sense. Anyway, we're making good progress here. Uh, the next one, this is a really beefy thing. You're going to want to have a periodic table in front of you to do these. Uh, we want to talk about naming chemicals. So when we actually have some sort of molecule where we have more than one element stuffed together, we need to know not only how to name them, but also how to write their chemical formula. Now, this is where we come down to uh, saying whether or not something is ionic or whether it is molecular. I want you to remember an ionic compound is where you have a metal and a non-metal. And a molecular compound is where you have just two non-metals, right? Now, the weird thing with this is with ionic compounds, you have to watch your ionic charges. Those are those numbers that are in the top right corner of every single element. 
For molecular compounds, you don't have to worry about those at all because molecular compounds only use nonmetals and we don't care about charges. Watch as I go over these. If you want to pause the video here and give these an honest shot, that's great. But otherwise, just because it's been a while, um, I'll just show you how we go over these. So for this first one, CAO, excuse me, sorry, something just went down the wrong way. CAO is, uh, you have to look at CA. If you look at your periodic table, you see that's calcium. And then O, of course, not a big surprise, that's oxygen. Now, calcium is a metal. Oxygen is a nonmetal. So because we have a metal and a nonmetal, we know that this is an ionic compound. Now, ionic compounds, when we go about naming them, they're actually pretty nice. You basically just list the metal name and then the non-metal name ending with ide. So for calcium and oxygen, this is literally just going to be calcium oxide. For this next one, we have N and O. N is nitrogen. That's a non-metal. And then uh, oxygen, of course, is also a non-metal. So because we have two non-metals, this is what we call a molecular compound. Molecular naming is a little weird, but in a way, it's also nice if you know what, uh, what the trick is. When you are naming molecular compounds, you have to watch how many of each of those elements you have. And then you have to use something called a prefix. So in other words, something that starts a word uh, in order to communicate how many of each of those you had. So hopefully you remember when we have a two, the prefix on that is going to be di. When we have one of them, the prefix on that is going to be mono. So this is going to be di nitrogen and then mono or just mon oxide. So di nitrogen monoxide, that would be the name of this molecular compound. We had to use these prefixes here because it was a molecular compound. You do not use prefixes if you have an ionic compound. Now this last one, COS or sorry, CO2SE3. Uh, notice the CO2, that's a lowercase o, so this is one element. If you look at your periodic table, you're going to see that that is cobalt, and that is a metal. As for SE, SE is selenium, that is a non-metal, so we know that this is going to be an ionic compound. Now, naming ionic compounds, as I mentioned earlier with that calcium oxide example, it's usually pretty easy, but there's something kind of funny about this one. Cobalt, if you look at your periodic table, Cobalt has two possible charges. I'll even just show you over here. Cobalt has two possible charges. It's either a two positive or a three positive charge. This is what we call a multivalent uh, element. So when you have something that's multivalent, you actually have to communicate in its ionic name which charge you used. So there's a little bit of a, little bit of a trick to this one. What I want you to notice is we have two cobalts and we have three seleniums. If you look at selenium on your periodic table, its charge must be negative two. So a single selenium is two negative, but we have three of them. So the overall charge of these three seleniums is three times negative two, which is six negative. That means my overall charge of cobalt must be six positive, but we have two cobalts. So think if you have two cobalts and the total charge is six positive, what must be the charge of each one? Well, hopefully you can see it just be six divided by two it's going to be a positive three charge. So here's how we communicate this. This is about as tough as these ones get. Since it has to be a three positive charge, we have to write this as cobalt, and then in Roman numerals, say three, and then selenide. Remember, I changed the ending of selenium to an ide. You always have to do that, whether it's ionic or molecular. So cobalt three selenide, that right there, that would be its name. If this is kind of scary to you, if you're looking at this and going, oh, holy smokes, I do not get this. Uh, there are some other videos I posted on Google Classroom before where you can get some ionic and molecular compound naming and formula practice. You might want to go back and watch these. Remember, this is just a surface level review in this video today. Uh, anyway, we're going to do the flip side of this now. Uh, now I want you to write the chemical formula for each. If you feel really comfortable and you want to pause the video and give these a try, that would be a great idea. But otherwise, I'll go over these. First one right there, triphosphorus pentaoxide. I'm seeing some prefixes right off the bat. Without even looking at phosphorus and oxygen, I can tell right now that this is a molecular compound. In other words, two different uh, nonmetals. The reason I know that, of course, is because prefixes like tri and penta, they don't get used unless it's a molecular compound. Now, tri means three and penta means five. So I know I have three phosphorus and I have five oxygen. Well, phosphorus on the periodic table is just a P. So I'm going to say I have three of those and then five oxygen. So I'll have five 
oxygen's right there. So P3O5, that's all there is to that. Molecular compounds are pretty nice when you're going from the, the name to the formula. Uh, now this next one, silver sulfide. Silver sulfide. Well, hopefully you can see that silver is a metal and sulfur is a non-metal. Uh, so silver sulfide, we want to write the formula for this, but because this is an ionic compound, we actually have to watch our ionic charges very carefully. If you look in your periodic table for silver, you're going to see silver has a one positive charge. Sulfur, on the other hand, sulfur has a two negative charge. When you have an ionic compound, the overall charge of that ionic compound has to balance out to zero. So if you look at this and say, well, silver has a one charge and uh, sulfur has a two negative charge, you have to figure out how many of each of those you're going to need to make this balance out to zero. Well, hopefully you remember there was a really nice simple trick that actually helps us kind of cheese this and get, to get the answer right away. You just look at each of the charges and you swap them and drop them. So in other words, this two on the sulfur, that's how many silvers I'm going to have. Silver, it has a weird element symbol, it's AG. Silver, I'm going to have two of them, so AG2. And then sulfur, I'm going to take the number from silver, so one, and that's how many sulfurs I'm going to have. So I'll have sulfur, but just one of them. So I won't have to write a number there. I'll just write an S for sulfur. Just to double check this, if we have two silvers, that means the overall charge of our silver is now positive two. And we have one sulfur, so the overall charge of that is negative two. Would you look at that? It's all balanced, right? So kind of a neat trick for that. Uh, just remember, ionic compounds are definitely the more tricky of the bunch. You have to watch your charges carefully. Now, this last one, titanium three oxide. If we were going the other way around, if I had given you the formula for this and asked you to write the name, those are the ones that drive us insane because we can tell by this three that this is multivalent. In other words, that titanium has more than one possible charge. But here's what's nice about going from the name to the formula. At least now, I've told you what charge titanium has. You don't even have to look at your periodic table. We can say titanium has a three positive charge. Oxygen, on the other hand, you might want to look at your periodic table unless you remember it. Oxygen has a two negative charge. So when we write the formula for this, we have to think, okay, how many titaniums do I need and how many oxygens do I need? Well, again, the good news is you can use that swap and drop method. So in other words, let's just take this two on the oxygen and let's give it to the titanium. So titanium, uh, its element symbol, I believe is Ti. So Ti for titanium, we're gonna have two of those. So Ti2 and then oxygen, which is just O, we're gonna have three of them because we just swap the numbers. So three goes to oxygen, two goes to titanium, and then we drop it down just to say how many of each of those we have. To make this a little bit more clear, remember if we have two titaniums and each titanium is three positive, the overall charge of our titanium would be six positive. If we have three oxygens and each one of them is two negative, that means the overall charge of the oxygens is six negative and they match. That's what we're hoping for. That's what we always want to get done. So those are the chemical formulas for each of those. Again, if this is something that's still tricky to you, go back and watch some of those other videos because this is one of the most important things that we cover in this unit. I would even argue most important thing we cover in all of Science 9 is naming and writing formulas for ionic and molecular compounds. Anyway, we're almost done here. That was the, uh, the real beef for today. Uh, the other things you have to understand though are types of chemical reactions. You need to know the difference between an endothermic and an exothermic reaction. Remember, endothermic, <clears throat> excuse me, endothermic are where heat enters the reaction. Endo enters, heat is entering the reaction. Generally speaking, these will feel cold, but not always. Don't go thinking that endothermic reactions are always cold. They're just absorbing heat. They're just taking in some energy to, to perform the chemical reaction. Uh, an exothermic reaction, these are the ones that release heat. So the heat is exiting the reaction. Generally speaking, these will feel hot, but again, not always. It's just heat is leaving uh, the reaction. It doesn't have to be happening very fast. I put three examples on here. We talked about all three of these before. Uh, burning a match, of course, as soon as you ignite a match. I think that one's probably pretty obvious. That's an exothermic reaction because as this reacts, there's a lot of heat that's being released. Heat is exiting the reaction. It's coming out of the matchstick and uh, being released into the environment. So in other words, when this chemical reaction occurs, energy is being generated and it's being sent out to the outside environment. Uh, this next one, cooking an egg or cooking anything in general, that one is often kind of sneaky because you think, oh, that's really, that's really warm. But in order to cook an egg, it has to be absorbing heat. So this is actually an endothermic reaction. 
Heat is entering that egg and it's causing it to cook. In other words, it's causing a chemical reaction. Now, the one that's often trickiest to the bunch, rusting. So this old van that's rusting out here in this field. Uh, rusting, believe it or not, is actually an exothermic reaction. Uh, if you look at the uh, actual chemical formulas for, for a rust reaction, we're not going to look at that today, but if you were to look at the chemical formula for a rust reaction, it's actually weirdly similar to a burning reaction. Uh, so in a weird way, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but in a weird way, you could almost think of rusting as like a really, really, really slow burn. Not exactly the perfect way of thinking about it, but it is a good analogy, right? It is an exothermic reaction uh, because it is technically releasing heat, just very, very slowly, not enough to, to perceive. Uh, last thing we got to talk about, and then we're done for today, um, the law of conservation of mass. Uh, basically, what this means is when you react two things together, matter is neither created nor destroyed. It just changes from one form to another. Um, so if you had a closed system, so if you had like a box that you were doing a reaction in and nothing could leave the box, the mass of all the things that you put into the reaction will equal the mass of all the things that come out of the reaction. So if you burn some wood, the mass of the ashes at the end will equal basically what went into it. Now, of course, ashes aren't the only thing that's produced when you burn something. There's also smoke. You'd have to capture all that smoke and store it and, then, and find the mass of it somehow. So if you have a closed system where everything is all enclosed uh, and nothing can escape, the mass of everything before will equal the mass of everything after. It doesn't get created or destroyed. Uh, now, of course, in an open system, like if you were doing a, a campfire in your backyard, it's possible that some of the matter will float away. So in other words, that smoke is going to leave. So the mass is going to go down and what you have left over. But if you were to go somehow capture all that smoke, um, you would still have the same mass as you did before. So kind of interesting. It's an important one to understand, um, but a really small one. There's not really too much we do with that. Anyway, we're done. That was a long video today. I apologize. Um, but what I'd like you working on is the chemistry unit review study guide. Now, I might have provided you with one before. Um, and if I did, you might just want to disregard it because there was a lot of junk information in there that we don't need to know. And there were some questions that were really poor quality. Uh, so I revised this. I put this on Google Classroom. You will need to complete these questions. Don't go feeling like you have to complete them all today. That is absurd. You will be given several days to work on this because it is quite the booklet. Another thing that I posted on Google Classroom is the chemistry unit checklist. We're going to use this for a task next day. So if you look at this checklist, you'll see it pretty much matches what we reviewed today. But just an FYI that that's out there, we'll use that for another task later on. Anyway, uh, get started on that study guide if you can. Uh, if you need any help, please reach out to me. Best of luck.